Hey, this is the fourth and last segment of the volcano chapter and uh, this slide just shows you the plate tectonic setting and different kind of volcanoes. Uh, so if you are in, in, um, in divergent plate boundaries, which is rifting or mid-oceanic ridges or hotspot volcanoes, you always will get uh, low SiO2, low viscosity, mafic basaltic lava, since people don't have to be scared, usually it just flows friendly. You can just actually make the flow go away from your house so it wouldn't get uh, be put on fire. Uh, if you have an oceanic, oceanic plate boundary, those are usually um, making like anthracitic, sometimes basaltic, but mostly anthracitic, even toward the, the rhyolitic kind of composition. So it's more explosive, more dangerous. And if you are... Um, in um, oceanic continental plate boundary, then you get endocytic rhyolitic like Mount St. Helen and those guys. Um, and if you are um, under the continent hotspot volcano, those are the super volcanoes because what happens, you know, even though it's coming from the mantle, it has to melt through the, the uh, continental crust, which makes it extremely, extremely explosive because it becomes very, very felsic and it's, it's just very explosive. So now we are going through the volcanic hazards. Uh, the first one is the lava. As I just told you that when you are in a mafic setting, like a low SiO2 volcanic setting such as Hawaii, the biggest problem you might have is that the volcano comes through the roads or it comes through your house. So actually, when I went to Hawaii, I could see these, um, these roadblocks, which basically uh, I put down, so making sure that the lava will not flow through the house, so it doesn't go places where you don't want them to go. So if they can predict which way the lava is flowing, they can actually build walls and block, block the roads that it wouldn't go through. The next one is the pyroclastic explosion, and you kind of know that it's very, very, very dangerous because it's glowing cloud, that it's very high temperature, and the volcanic ash is very, very bad for you. And and also the gases are very, very bad. Uh, I'll have to go this way. Uh, the Lahar, we already mentioned how bad it is. That's when the volcano is really high. It has snow on top of it, and as it starts erupting, the snow melts. And it comes down as very, very fast flowing, muddy, uh, full of rocks, flow, which kills everything which is on its way. There is nothing you can do against this. And this just shows this very famous Lohar. When the Nevado de Arroyo in Colombia erupted, it killed 23,000 people. The, the town was about 30 kilometers from the volcano. It's like, like almost like Blacksburg from here. So nobody really thought anything, but it was in a, in a valley and everything happened so fast. And it was like 2 a.m. in the morning when this came and it just went through everything and killed 20,000 people. Anytime I think about it, I almost want to cry. cry. And this is the glowing cloud. I kind of already mentioned it, the pyroclast, when, when it's really, really high temperature. And if it reaches you, you're just going to burn. Not good. Um, like that. This is like um, the glowing cl cloud. It, it's the Unsen volcano, which killed a bunch of people. The toxic gases, of course, because you breathe the CO2 and the carbon monoxide and the hydrochloric acid, this is not good either. And it makes acid rain, so on the long term, it's really, really bad. And uh, it also kills people. Some of these uh, gases are not toxic, but they can be deadly when it's very high concentration. This is the phreatic explosion. I already kind of mentioned that. That's when water goes into the volcano. And the most famous phreatic explosion is Krakatau. And uh, basically the, the Krakatau was about 100 megaton explosion. Where Hiroshima, when they 
drop Americans dropped the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. It was only 20 kiloton. Remember, one megaton is a thousand kilotons. So 20 versus 100 megaton. It's amazing. Uh, it killed 36,000 people really uh, fast. And this is the atmospheric dis disruption, which is like later on from the aerosol uh, causing the cooling, the acid rains, and all that bad news. So right here, that just shows the disruption after the Pinatubo. It caused like two years of coldness. And so this is all together, the lava, pyroclastic explosion, Lohar, the glowing cloud, the toxic gases, phreatic explosions, and the atmospheric uh, disruptions. Now, what I want to show you that how can we predict volcanic eruptions? And I got this slides. I got these slides from somebody I can't remember now from who, but I only use it for, for, for uh, teaching you about. So the first thing what you see when a volcano is getting ready to erupt is that you have uh, increases and changes in seismicity. So. Earthquakes are usually the earliest signs of, of volcanic unrest. And uh, when you have uh, earth, earthquake swarms, they usually uh, means that the eruption is coming. So these, uh, these uh, earthquake activity has four characteristic types. Sorry, no. Volcanic seismicity has very distinct uh, characteristics from the tectonic seismic uh, seismicity. Uh, when when you have to run away, you know the volcano is coming. The most important one is the harmonic tremor. So you kind of want to avoid to be around when this harmonic tremor is around because that is the for sure sign of the volcanic eruption. So the harmonic tremor is when you want to leave. So if you ever look up Yellowstone and, and see that what kind of earthquake activity is present, then if you see harmonic tremor, you really have to start thinking of doing, uh, you know, to do something because might be, especially if they put the red flag up in the park or it closes, don't wait for the government. Just check it sometimes. Like if you hear that Yellowstone National Park is being closed, then you really have to start looking for the harmonic tremors because as soon as that starts, the eruption is is uh, imminent. It will happen. Um, The next thing is the the increased and changes in seismicity. You also can look at the geodetic ma monitoring because as the as the the volcanic the molten lava is kind of collected close to the surface, the the height and everything is changing, and uh, you you will start seeing gas emissions. Uh, so that is also kind of a very important sign for eruption. And also, uh, if you look at the pH of the waters around the volcano, it's also going to be more acidic. So that's also a very important sign of an imminent eruption. And what I have here is an example of what happened before Mount St. Helen erupted. So. Here is Mount St. Helen. Uh, this is the Columbia River Gorge. So Mount St. Helen is right next to it. It's right here. So it's typical oceanic continental plate boundary volcano. It's pretty explosive. So this is the first thing that uh, was important about it that between 75 and 1975 and 1980 there was 44 earthquake in five years 44 but between march 15 and march 20th there was uh uh there was more than 100 earthquakes so now it's like in 
five days more than a hundred so that just starts to say that hey you guys I am getting ready something is happening so they started uh, more they put more seismograph uh, uh, in the area and actually they put a person no 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 they just put three seismic stations you won't have to know this you know I'm kind of just reading these things too but it's kind of important so put this light to away and if you ever hear that Yellowstone is on red alert or they close the parking take this light show out look at it on your computer and see what kind of signs were there before before uh, it erupted so you can see the same signs and get away if you are happening to be in Denver or those areas because it's all going to be bad so This is the next one. Scientists started to think if uh, if Mount St. Helens was preparing to erupt. Uh, in in I can't see it pretty good, you know, right here. March 27, 1980, there was a sequence of small phreatic explosions. You know how the snow goes into the opening up volcano, and that produces small scale phreatic explosions um, and there was a, a crater 200 to 250 feet which opened up on top of the mountain now the scientists started to really closely monitor the ground deformation they they checked the pH changes and gas emissions and they started to close down many parts of the mountain and they evacuated it too uh, so the power company started to drown reservoirs because you know if a volcano erupt that causing big floods so therefore they you don't you don't want that to happen so it's very important too april 1st 1st was the first harmonic tremor uh and the second crater this is this is here showing the harmonic tremor so this is what you have to look for ever um, so the tourists all wanted to come to see their option and um, they did bring roadblocks in they closed down the roads they didn't want people to be on the mountains in case there is gonna be an eruption of course uh, they mapped out the hazard zones and um, it was really interesting because there was a local hatchery and the pH dropped for, from 6.8 to 5.8. This is already the outgassing of the volcano. You know, all the, all the gases, I remember the hydrochloric acid, the hydrofluoric acid, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, they make the pH of the, of the surrounding waters to drop. And 6.8 to 5.8 is a big drop. That just means that the acid is like 10 times more in the water than it was before. So in early April, a bulge started to grow on the mountain, and it was about five feet per day. That's pretty fast, you know, if you think about. So there was a monitoring station five miles away from the from the summit, and they monitored. There was like a person there, and he monitored the bulge and the seismic activity. And after that, this the eruptive activity quieted that's why you never know when a volcano is gonna up just don't know there are the signs and you have to actually evacuate people from the neighborhood you have to close down the roads and you have no idea when it's gonna happen you might have to wait for months but when you have harmonic tremor that's almost 100 percent it's gonna up this is how Mount St. Helen looked before that option it was a beautiful snowy mountain And uh, the U.S. geologists, because of this bulge growth and everything, the geologists were hundred percent that there will be uh, there will be an eruption. So during this relative quiet period, people actually just started to break down the roadblocks, and they went in anyways. Uh, on May the fifteenth, explosion stopped. But the bulge was continuing to grow and it was about five feet per day 
and uh, there was more seismic activity and it was about 50 days since the first uh, low explosion yet there was no sign that there, there was any fresh magma around so um, between May 16th and 17th the seismic activity decreased somewhat and uh, homeowners started to break down roadblocks as I already mentioned and they were export, ex escorted of course they didn't let them go back and um, on May the 17th uh, in the afternoon a volcanolog volcanologist his name was David Johnston this guy right here took over at the post which was about five miles away from from the summit and um, yeah uh, at 8 32 a.m. there was an earthquake it was a 5.1 which is a huge one for a volcano and at this moment the north face finally collapsed in a landslide and because of this releasing pressure actually uncapped the mountain and the the whole mountain blew up and at 8 32 a.m. David Johnston radioed Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, and he died right there. So he was one of the 50 people who died at the eruption of Mount St. Helene. And Mount St. Helene blew in a lateral blast to the north, and that took the USGS Observatory, United States Geological Survey Observatory, and the guy who was on post, David Johnston, did it, along with 56 other people. So that was the sad news. I hope you did learn uh, the signs before the volcano. So you got earthquakes, bulge, some lophiatic explosions, the harmonic tremor is the for sure sign. And uh, yeah, those are, f and the pH drop in the surrounding waters. These are the for sure signs that there will be an eruption. So if you look at this in anywhere you live and that is close by a volcano, harmonic tremor, pH drop, uh, bulge forming, phreatic explosions, you have to get the hell out of that and make sure that you're not going to stay around the volcano because it's going to erupt. So there. Uh, this is the, the way the mountain hell in blue. Nobody thought that it will go to the side. They thought that it would go up, but it did go to the side. And this here shows the the ash cloud, like the ash cover of Mount St. Helen. That one cubic kilometer made this much ash cover in the US. Don't ask me about this one because I don't know. The wind must have done some funky things. Of course, this was not big because the, the explosion was relatively small and the amount of the pyroclast come out was very, very small. So you can imagine what would happen if, if Yellowstone erupted, like with a thousand cubic kilometer or 2,500 cubic kilometer. Even Virginia would be under volcanic ash. So this is the the devastation of Mount St. Helene right here. And this also shows the same thing. Now the problem with this is that we have all these volcanoes and they are all dormant. None of them are extinct. All these volcanoes can come anytime. One of the worst is uh, Mount Rainier because that is right next to Seattle and Tacoma so there is there is hundreds of thousands of people which they couldn't evacuate because where would they go so it's a big problem so there is a very close mon monitoring on Mount St. Helene and um, Mount, Mount Rainier sorry and this just shows you again the global distribution of volcanoes so you have to understand that this it's a real danger and volcanoes are just about everywhere so i hope you enjoyed it and i think it's really important and interesting chapter you have to understand volcanoes because you never know where life takes you so you have to understand bye for now